Okay, so here's how we're going to do this today. First half of the program, we're going to talk about the essential nutrients, plant essential nutrients, what they are, and how they get into the plant, and how they move around. Then we're, we're going to talk about the nutrient uptake processes, how they get taken up. Okay, and we're going to spend the whole morning doing that. And then in the afternoon, we're then going to start talking about fertilizers, fertilizer types, and how do we monitor, what are the easy ways to monitor um, nutrient in, in your system, you know, and methods that aren't as costly, right? So by the end of the day, you're going to have quite a bit of information. So the essential nutrients, how we're going to break this down is first we're going to talk about what the essential nutrients are. Just like people, not every other organism, there are essential nutrients for an organism to grow and develop. We'll talk about those, how they are taken up, because each one is taken up a little bit differently, and then how they're allocated in the plant, because nutrients are allocated differently depending on the nutrient type. And then we're going to go through some plant nutrient disorders. And then later I will give you a handout, and it's my cheat sheet, so that you can carry this and throw it in your truck or your car, it can sit out in the sun, and it's going to hold up pretty well, and it's laminated so you don't have to worry about getting it wet, and the holes are punched on the side so you can put it in the binder. <laughs> we try to think about it. Okay, so let's talk about the essential nutrients. So if you look at a plant, there's, oops, back there. Most of the plant is water, right? So people want to eat healthy and everything, and they, they buy these dried vegetables and everything, like there's tons of calories in them. I'm like, yeah, because all the water is gone, you're eating condensed plant material. But what we're going to talk about today is only representing 3 to 15 percent of the whole plant mass. And so it's the minerals that are in there. The organic matter, the carbon, comes from photosynthesis, which we're not going to get into today. And, and then, of course, the water, which is a really rare commodity anymore. But we're going to focus on this 3 to 15 percent. Okay, now in the world of science, we like to, we like to organize things. And we, we organize nutrients in a plant is we have macronutrients and micronutrients. And macronutrients, when you take a dry tissue sample, and if you've ever sent in tissue samples, you will see that there will be a report and it'll come back as percent, percent dry matter. And the element that's the most is nitrogen. It's usually three to five, depending on the plant type. And then the other macronutrient is phosphorus, potassium, and NPK, if you look at fertilizers, that's that number 20, 20, 20. That's what the fertilizer is. So these three are in the highest content, and then sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. So these are macronutrients, and when you get a lab report back, which I'll show you, they are presented as a percentage. Now, if you look at a lab report, this is one from Waypoint, and you can see that they have the results of, this was blackberry, and you can see the percent nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and sodium. They report sodium. That's not an essential nutrient, but sometimes if there's a lot of sodium in the system, there can be problems with salt toxicity um, so, or sodium toxicity. So, but they'll present that as a percentage. So that's how you always see macronutrients presented in a tissue report. So now there's the micronutrients. And micronutrients are essential plant nutrients as well, but they're required in such small concentrations that if we were to present them as percentage, for example, iron, at 50 parts per million, it would be 0.0050%, which is a little hard for the brain to wrap around. So most reports will present these micronutrients as parts per million, and that's the conversion. Okay, one part per million is 0.0001%. And so the micronutrients are iron, manganese, copper, boron, zinc, molybdenum, chlorine, and nickel. And everyone thinks that plant nutrition has been taken care of and we don't have to worry about things anymore. But nickel was discovered as an essential nutrient in the 1980s, which in my lifetime, that's my lifetime. So it doesn't seem that long ago. But even though these are required in very small quantities, they're very important because if you don't have these, the plant cannot develop properly. But we're going to talk about how later how the, you can identify which nutrient deficiencies you have or give you by symptoms in the plant. Because plants will tell you what is wrong with them in most cases. So, and the way I remember this is I have fertilizer management cuts back the zone of most clutter of chemicals nicely. 
and that's my, what do you call that? What's that called? Praise. Yeah, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> he hasn't had his coffee yet. <laughs> okay, so, so that's the micronutrients. So we have macronutrients and micronutrients. And if you take, you can hand these out. Um, this will have all of them. Each of you can take one. Um, we have enough, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But I just want you to know that we'll have all the essential nutrients and we'll talk about them. So when you look at the micronutrients, you'll see here, boron, zinc, manganese, iron, copper, and aluminum. Aluminum's not an essential nutrient, but sometimes it's in the system and they have to wash it. But they're presented as parts per million rather than percentage. So most labs will give you that number and that's how it's presented. And some labs, this, is a, this lab does pretty well with also uh, indicating with a blackberry uh, what the amount is, concentration, and if it's adequate or inadequate or too much. Unfortunately, in ornamental plant production, we have thousands of different cultivars and species and genera, and it's really, we don't have those numbers to give you a range, but in many industries like citrus and avocado, they have standard leaves, leaves and they, can, they know what the amount should be, and so they can, they can set up a table for you like this. Okay, but things like cactus, you know, the different crassulas and stuff, that just does not exist and we're on our own, basically. Any questions so far? Feel free to ask me questions. Don't, you know, I don't want to talk all day. I will, though. <laughs> I'm from Pittsburgh. So yeah. that's, we do that. Ron, are all these things, if we go into the web later to refresh ourselves, it's all there? Those slides are all going to be there. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is the cheat sheet that I have. And so when we go through each of the nutrients and we talk about their deficiency symptoms and toxicity, the other thing is nutrients interact with each other. Okay, so if you have too much of one thing, another thing isn't taken up as much. But those are cheat sheets, and I'll get to those, but that will go through all the essential nutrients, how much they're supposed to be average in an average plant, which, what is that? Um, and then when can you run into deficiency symptoms? and you know, because it's not always about the fertilizer, it's about the environment, right? Um, we have to think about everything, the environment, the root system. If the root system isn't growing, nutrients are taken up. In the wintertime, when citrus does some rogue shoots in the middle of January, you'll see that they're all chlorotic. And it's not that you didn't fertilize, it's that the roots are not growing yet. And so they can't actively take up the nutrients needed for those rogue shoots. And so you usually cut them off right there. So we'll go through that a little bit. So you have all these essential nutrients. You have the macronutrients now, and there's micronutrients. You often get micronutrients in these little packages, chelated forms, and they'll have a host of them in there. And usually they're presented that way because they're required in such low quantities. If you start applying one versus the other, you can get easily get into toxicity. So that's why you will buy chelated packages, and we'll talk about what chelates do too in a minute, because they're expensive relative to some other nutrients, but they have a purpose. So nutrient update, how does it work? Okay, so if you look at a root system, and I, I'm not going to sacrifice any of my plants that are up today, but usually we look at root systems, but roots are actively growing systems, and if you look here, you have basically a root cap which protects the root as it's actively growing through the soil, even in media, artificial media. And there's these root hairs. And the root hairs are very temporary, okay? As they grow, new root hairs will grow as the root grows. And those root hairs are really important because they're where all the enzymes are present to taking up all the nutrients, okay? It's not just this passive thing. There are active enzymes that are taking up nitrogen and iron and magnesium. And it's in this region where that occurs. So in the wintertime, when the soils are cold, out in the field or even in media, in our containers, root systems aren't actively growing. And so a lot of nutrients don't get taken up. So even if you apply things in the wintertime, that's, they're not always going to be taken up. Um, so as the soil is warm here in California, then things start growing, the roots start growing, and you start getting more nutrient uptake and water uptake. And your symptoms of Chlorosis on the citrus trees will disappear. Avocados are more, they're not, they usually flush out later, so they're usually in a different ball game. But citrus will sometimes do rogue shoots, and some other plants will too. We have a, 
a very strange climate here because we have cold soils in the wintertime, I think are cold compared to, to, to Florida. And then what happens is we have these warm sunny days. And so the canopies are warm and sometimes things will grow, <laughs> but the roots aren't growing. So there's a little problem there, you know. And in the nursery industry, that can be a big problem when we're trying to get things out for February market. So you have to throw things like gardenias and stuff in the greenhouse or a shade house or something warm to get them to green up a little bit and get the juice to be taken up so you can get them on the market in February, which is kind of early for most parts of the country. So this is a really an active region for development. So anything that impacts that, so if you have pathogens, phytophthors or, or just a, a nemesis in the avocado industry, if anything's attacking those root systems, it's gonna impact the plant's ability to take up nutrients, right? So even though my brain, one, one of the faults I have of myself is that I'm always thinking plant nutrition and I don't, ex insects don't exist, diseases don't exist, I'm always thinking nutrition. But that's not the case. There are things that can attack the root systems and can impact the plant's ability to pick up nutrients. So, so plants take up nutrients through the root hairs. Right? It's an active seed system, and once they get in there, they can go up into the plant. Now, what else happens? Okay. Nutrient uptake process can be either active or passive. And what I mean by that is active, it requires energy. So the root system in general is a negatively charged system, okay? So there are certain ions that are positively charged and certain ions that are negatively charged. So nitrate and phosphates and sulfates are negatively charged ions, okay? And so you understand the positive and negative thing, right? Okay, so they have to go up against electrochemical gradient. So they require more energy to be taken up into the plant, okay? Things like calcium and magnesium are positively charged. And so they're not going against the electrochemical gradient, so they're more passively taken up. So do you understand the active concept? Now, selective, what does that mean? Okay, I mentioned it a little bit ago. The roots can distinguish one nutrient from another nutrient. And the way I look at this, you know, I travel with this toy, and I don't care what people do, but it works. So the root system is kind of like this. You have these different pathways for different nutrients. The charges of the atom of a mag magnesium has two positive charges, calcium has two positive charges, potassium has one positive charge, nitrate has one negative charge, okay? So these, each molecule has a, an identity, a, a size and a charge difference. And because of that, the plant has the ability to adapt and it has developed enzyme pathways to take up specific nutrients. So with nitrate, it would take up nitrate and it only goes up to this pathway. And if you had magnesium, magnesium would go up through this pathway, right? Mm -hmm. so, so it knows, it can identify the nutrient at the enzyme pathway and bring it into the plant. So you should be sitting there thinking, oh, the plant has it all figured out. So I can't make any mistakes, it'll figure it out. But we know that's not true, right? You can make mistakes. You can over-fertilize. You can do, overdo it with one nutrient versus another nutrient because the system isn't perfect. It can get confused. So and the reason I say that, and I had this little ball here, is because even though calcium and magnesium are different, they're not quite that different. They're not different enough. And so sometimes if you have too much um, calcium, you don't get enough magnesium taken up because the two islands are, are very similar. And so the plant may start taking up calcium in the magnesium channels, mm -hmm. okay? And then you aren't getting the magnesium taken up. So and we have a lot of calcium in many of our soils and stuff. So sometimes magnesium deficiency is, is common and you see it. And I'll tell you how you can see that in plants later. But, so this is why it's selected, and this is how it works. And it's based on the charge and the size of the molecule, okay? But it's not a perfect system. And we have different fertilizer types out there because of that. Some plants require more of one nutrient versus another. Okay. Let's add, let's get the water even more muddy. Okay, when plants are taking up nutrients, it has to maintain a charge balance. 
So when something like nitrate is taken up into the plant, the plant can release hydroxyl ions. And if something like ammonium is taken up into the plant, which is positively charged, it can release a, um, a hydrogen ion, or it can even re-release -re an ammonium or potassium. But because of this in exchange, okay, um, it can change the pH of your rhizosphere. And so if you take up a lot of nitrate, you can get an increase in the rhizosphere pH, right? And that's why nitrate can raise the pH a little bit, okay? And if you use ammoniacal forms of nitrogen, ammonium sulfate, for example, you will see a drop in the pH. And so that's why there's no big grown blueberries in here, right? So a lot of blueberry growers will do ammonium, ammonium sulfate to, keep the, to help with the acidification process. Um, so that's why you can see changes in pH in the rhizosphere. And we also have rootstocks. You know, rootstocks are very popular in helping disease resistance and also um, abilities to take up certain nutrients. And so there are some rootstocks in peaches, for example, that are more acidifying in the rhizosphere to take up iron because of the soils where they are growing in uh, commercially in some parts of the U.S. are very, very high in pH. And so some of these rootstocks actually help lower the rhizosphere pH to take up the iron because it dissolves the iron and brings it up into the plant. Okay? So not too complex, but yeah. We're going to throw in one more thing. <laughs> okay, nutrient uptake signals from the shoot. This is kind of new, and we didn't talk about this before, but as I've seen more plant material being grown, different varieties in the nurseries in the past few years, I think we need to discuss this. So, there's another thing. So, when a plant... Many, many of the nutrients that are taken up into a plant, if they're deficient in the shoots, the plant can send a signal down to the roots that it needs more of that to activate some of those enzymes to get those nutrients up into it. And some plants take it a little bit further. So a lot of the uh, Australian plants, what they have are what's called proteoid roots, which is not to be confused with mycorrhizal associations that, that a lot of plants have, like avocados. Um, the proteoid roots are actually roots that grow from the plant. The plant actually grows these roots. And it's cluster root development by select plant species. Many of the Australian leucospermums and stuff will do this. And what happens is they originate from the plant, and it's a signal from the shoot indicating that it, it has a low phosphorus in the shoots. And so it sends a signal down to the plant, and the plant starts growing these proteoid roots. And these are cluster roots that are more efficient at taking up phosphorus, okay? This is why we have difficulty in the, in the beginning growing these, is because we have a lot of phosphorus in our, many of our production systems and uh, garden systems, and so there gets to be phosphorus toxicity because there's too much in the system. Even though the plant doesn't need it, it may have these proteoid roots. But the other reason why proteoid roots can grow is that, um, Shoot nitrogen and iron deficiencies can also turn on that signal. So it's not a perfect system. It's not just phosphorus now. It will also do this to get iron and nitrogen. So if we have a high pH system, for example, and we don't have a lot of iron, but we have enough phosphorus, these things will kick in and start growing. And then you end up with phosphorus toxicity. So there's a little balancing act there when we're growing these in production, some of these Australian plants. So an interesting a net mechanism, but also truly one that demonstrates that plants communicate from the shoots to the roots, right, to get what they need. Now, mycorrhizal roots are different because mycorrhizal roots are not associated with the plant. They're a fungi that colonizes the plant system. And they're very popular um, in terms of putting those in production. But they're a beneficial fungi, and depending on the plant type, they can colonize inside the root and then go outside, or they can colonize just around the roots, ecto or nendo, mycorrhizal relationships. And it's a symbiotic relationship, which means that those fungi are growing in the root system because they're getting something from the plant. And what they're getting from the plant, they don't photosynthesize because they're in the ground, they don't have light. So they're getting carbohydrates from the plant. In exchange, they're giving the plant nutrients, and they can be very efficient at doing that too. They can really, yeah. the, these fungal hyphae can really get into the, the soil and mine, if you want to say the word, more nutrients from the rhizosphere to get nutrients up into the plant. Now, 
there's a lot of mycorrhizal products in the market. You know, we know that. And so one thing, we've, we've done several studies, and we know that for the mycorrhizae to be um, functional and work to be um, the infectivity, which means the ability of the mycorrhizae to infect the roots and get into the roots and help the roots, and the effectivity, how good they do when they're in there, is based on the media type. So does anyone, okay, baking, let's go to baking, sourdoughs, okay, sourdough breads, okay? There's a yeast, right? If you go to San Francisco, they have wonderful sourdough bread. But San Francisco has a very interesting climate. It's cool and humid, right? And the yeast that's there is different than the yeast that you can go and it develops down here in Southern California or in Florida. So the yeast type is different. So the sourdough has a different flavor. And we really can't mimic that down here, okay? And so it's kind of like that. The media, the, the, the mycorrhizal fungi will evolve for a media type. And some local nurseries have done that and work with their own mycorrhizal associations, native nurseries, and they have one that works, but it works for their media only, and when you try another media, it doesn't work, okay? So, so these things evolve, and if you really wanted to work with this, you would have to develop your own for the most part. The other thing is mycorrhizae associations, they, they do not like high fertility, and you have to watch the fungicides because it's a fungus, right? So you have to be careful about that. Some fungicides might be more detrimental than others. I don't know which ones those are, but it's a fungus. So with the fungus among us, you have to watch the fungicides. So because of our usually high fertility in our, in our commercial production systems in containers and the use of some fungicides, the chances of this happening and successfully having mycorrhizal associations in your system are going to be really low. Avocado, on the other hand, you work your system out. It, those mycorrhizal associations are, are a true gem. And that's why the mycorrhizal, many of the avocados, magnolias, they have surface roots. And they're underneath the leaf litter. And there's a lot of mycorrhizal associations and stuff. And that really helps with them growing. Um, so the exceptions with the nursery industry are the native nurseries. Because many of them have extremely low fertility programs. They work with mostly... Uh, a granular fertilizers, they don't do liquid feed for the most part, and so they they are usually successful with it, with the native plants that they have. Okay, so it's a root shoot signal too, shoots to roots and roots to shoots. So there's a lot going on, it's a very complex system, but we can still work with it and we've successfully done so for many years. Let's move on. Oh, it's frozen. Trust me, your computer's better than mine. Okay, so nutrient allocation in plants. Oh, the other thing is, when do we want to take a break? Like at night, an hour? I guess there's a bathroom over, the, over yonder, so they can tell you where it is. Uh, I live in Georgia, so I can stay yonder. Okay, nutrient allocation in plants. So, nutrient uptake processes, there's different ways. Once the nutrients are taken up, um, you have mobility. And nutrients will move up through the xylem from the roots. Does everyone know about the xylem in the fall? The xylem is the water uptake channel for plants, and the phloem is what moves the sugars and some nutrients back and forth throughout the plants. Okay, and the, the phloem works two, two, two directions. Phloem can go from when that shoot has to send a signal to the roots for, new, for a specific nutrient, it comes down through the phloem. The xylem is only one way. It takes water and nutrients up from the plant to anything transpiring. Okay, so that's how that works. So, plants will have, the nutrients will be taken up from the roots to the shoots from the xylem, and it will go to wherever there's a lot of transpiration going on. Now, for mobile nutrients, so we talked about the macronutrients and micronutrients, now we're going to talk about mobile nutrients and immobile nutrients. But we're not talking about the soil, we're talking about within the plant, their mobility within the plant. Because some nutrients are not soluble or they're not very mobile in the soil, and you hear a lot about that. But we don't talk much about mobility within the plant. So first we're going to talk about mobile nutrients in the plant. The mobile nutrients in the plant are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, 
And I have these in little yellow, molybdenum and nickel, because they're not really mobile in the plant, but these two elements are really key players in nitrogen metabolism. So when their deficiency does occur, sometimes the symptoms look more like a nitrogen deficiency on the whole plant rather than something that's at the top. So mobile nutrient, what happens is, if you have nothing in the root system or the root system is being attacked by a pathogen or something, it's impaired for some reason, kind of like having your mouth shown shut, you know, you can't take up food. Um, if there's no nitrogen in this, in this system, what happens is the plant wants to maintain this actively growing new shoot. And so it says, okay, I need nitrogen. There's no nitrogen in the soil. I can't get it from here. So I'm going to remobilize. I'm going to break down the nitrogen that's stored in these oldest leaves. And I'm going to take that and take it to the shoot. Because plants, it's about reproduction and maintaining itself. And so it's going to remobilize the nitrogen and bring it up to the, the new growth. And if that nitrogen deficiency is not corrected, then the next set of leaves up are going to start turning yellow. And they're going to go up. And that nitrogen is going to go to the shoots, and these leaves are going to fall off. Okay, um, because of that, whenever you have a mobile nutrient deficiency symptom, it's always going to be the oldest leaves. Okay, so that way you can tell, for example, when there's a magnesium deficiency in the plant, and when we get to the micronutrients like iron, you'll see deficiency symptoms will start up in the shoots, in the top, in the new growth. And it, that never changes. Okay, so mobile nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, molybdenum, and nickel, you're going to usually, you're going to see the deficiency symptoms starting first in the older leaves, the oldest leaves. And then you should be sitting there saying, but wait a minute, how do we know which one it is? You know, I mean, well, the plants are really nice, actually, because the symptoms of the deficiency symptoms for these different ones are going to be slightly different because of the role that they play in the metabolism of the plant. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So that's what a mobile nutrient is. And you can see most of the micronutrients, if not all of them, are going to be in the, um, in the immobile section. So immobile nutrients, the way they work is, yes, they move up through the xylem from the transpiration stream, and they're carried up into the new growth. But if something happens, if something happens that there's no iron available, for example, in the roots, or more likely it's a high pH thing for us, and which iron is then precipitated out in the soil, what happens is the plant doesn't have the ability to really take up, to dissolve and remobilize iron in the oldest leaves. It's a little bit, but physiologically speaking, it's not enough. And so what happens is the new growth becomes chlorotic. So it's not the old growth, it's the new growth. So it's a very interesting thing that you can see that, right? And you know, when you're doing tissue samples, you and you, because you're growing a commodity, avocado and citrus, when you collect leaves to do samples, this is why it's so important to have a certain part of the plant. Because if you mix the oldest leaves with the newest leaves, there goes your symptoms. Your symptoms are just, you're not gonna know what you have because you have mixed everything together. So if you think you have a problem, you really need to be collecting the oldest leaves or the newest leaves and keep them separate. Okay. So the elements that are immobile are calcium, sulfur, iron, manganese, copper, boron, and zinc. So all those nutrients, when they run into a deficiency symptom, they're going to be in the new growth. Okay. And you've all seen iron deficiency. I know you have. You just have to realize it. Um, so that's where the deficiency symptoms are going to occur. And so once you correct that, and there's different ways of correcting that, if you have a soil issue, and you're working, so I, I'm going to point to Richard and Doug because they're in, it's growing in Brown and Disney. If you have a soil issue, then if you can't get the nutrient into the soil, then you can spray some uh, of, the, of the micronutrients on top of the plant, the foliar applications, that will help correct that. So, and you can save that new growth, okay? Okay. What's so funny? You know, I'll have to have questions. <laughs> I should know he the doesn't answer, know the rules right? yet. He's too new. I should know the answer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what's so funny about 
but twice sulfur is yellow. <laughs> sulfur is also, okay, good, thank you, I didn't see that. Sulfur also is kind of like uh, the molybdenum and nickel, and that sulfur deficiency can sometimes look like a whole yellowing of the plant, almost like a nitrogen deficiency. So some, the symptoms are harder to see, and sulfur deficiency, and we'll get into that later too, but that's why that's there. Um, the other thing is interesting about sulfur is that historically, sulfur has never been a deficiency problem because our air in, this, in the world was so polluted, there was enough sulfur in the air. And so deficiency symptoms never occurred unless you were in a very rural area. But now that our air is cleaning up, we're starting to see sulfur deficiencies in certain systems. That was a planted question. So <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> Okay, now the fun begins. The nutrient disorders, and how do we how do we look at the symptoms? How do we know what's going on? Okay, so pull your hand out. And there's coffee back there too. I need to know. Where the hand out? Oh yeah. Please tell me there's enough work. Okay, so I made this hand out right. And I have some Spanish, if you, if you want some Spanish for anybody that you're working with that needs a Spanish one. Um, probably the most complex one in the whole group. But for me, I always like to have this just to think about things. The nitrogen is broken down. I blew it up here. And the first thing you'll see across it, it's mobile. And I mean it's mobile in the plant. And percent nitrogen in the plant system is usually 1 to 6%. That one's all over the board, depending on the plant type. I wish I could help you, Maureen, more with the succulents, and then also, and I forget your name on the corner. Oh, David. David, because you do succulents. Well, not about ornamentals. Ornamentals. Please. But yeah, it's it's really a challenge with the ornamentals and stuff because there's so many different different types. But this is the range, and what's and then what I do is I give you examples of how these deficiency symptoms may occur and what, what types of scenarios, environmentally speaking, or climate-wise, what may happen. And with nitrogen, mild is usually uniform yellow and the senescence of the older leaves. And severe, usually the canopy is chlorotic and the plants become stunted. And we'll see photos of that in a little bit. And the soils. So basically anything in the soil that's going to it's good. Hi, good Hi. morning. Uh, good morning, sorry. That's OK. I don't mean to interrupt. I'm just looking for somewhere to sit. OK. Here. Awesome. We've got coffee, we've got breakfast, we've got drinks. <laughs> and you missed Thank the you. most important part. No, oh my gosh, that's terrible. So, but you can go ahead and introduce yourself because we're going around the room. OK. And, and who you represent and what you're growing. You know what? Um, I'm kind of here mostly for myself. Um, okay. Okay. I just, I'm Esmeralda, I'm Esme, I go by Esme, and I got out of the Marine Corps and I'm looking to see if uh, I may, I'm working with somebody about uh, manure as the fertilizer, so we'll okay. see how that goes. Well, we'll take breaks and then y'all can mix and mingle, mm -hmm. and I think that's as important as the workshop itself. Okay, thank you. So, is there any extra handouts? Yeah. I'm just one. Since that's where we are, and you go by Esme. 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 I like yes. that. Same. Okay. Yeah. So, so in the soils, basically the water logged or anaerobic soils, because plants need oxygen, the root systems need oxygen, because the root systems are living organism, parts of the plant, and they're respiring, right? And so, one thing people talk about photosynthesis, but usually they don't talk about respiration. And respiration occurs in plants too. And what's respiration? I always tell people we do this every Thanksgiving. When the holidays start, we eat too much, and we have to get on a treadmill and go for a walk and burn off all the turkey and pumpkin pie and pecan pie. And respiration is basically taking in oxygen and giving off CO2, burning off the carbohydrates, right? And so plants have that too. They need respiration for energy. Respiration produces the energy for us to walk, okay? Breathing in ox ox oxygen and giving off CO2. So that's why there needs to be oxygen in the roots of many plants, because the root systems themselves are respiring. Um, so waterlogged soils, anaerobic, will cause root systems to be stunted, so the plants can't take up nitrogen. 
leach sandy soils. And the reason leach sandy soils are a problem is because they can't hold nutrients. There's not a lot of reserve buffer. And so sandy soils are very nutrient poor. And so most of the nitrogen is leached out of the soil. Most fertilizer is leached out of the soil. Clay soils, on the other hand, are, even though they can be really low in oxygen, they hold nutrients really well, and they hold water really well. Um, but so those are the types of soils you usually see this happening to. And, high, and media, media is another different story because media, I always tell people, is mostly a hydroponic system glorified and that there's not a lot of binding sites for, for nutrients either. So sometimes that can be a problem if you don't have adequate fertilizer. Um, and you know, one thing I didn't throw in here, and I should, I just noticed that now after 22 years. Um, if you're using a, a media that has a lot of uh, like wood chips, uh, it's going to tie up the nitrogen. Microorganisms are going to tie up the, the nitrogen because they need nitrogen as well to break down the, the wood. So if it's bark, it's different. Bark has tannins in it, and it's really hard to break down. It lasts longer. But you'll know if you use any type of sawdust, it breaks down quickly, and your pot shrinks, so to speak, because it's breaking down when the microorganisms come in and tie it up. So the nitrogen can be easily tied up in some of those products. Um, nutrient interactions. Remember I talked about this and how it's not a perfect system? So toxicity. Ammonium, uh, toxicity of nitrogen would be like if you were using pure ammonium, you would have competition with potassium, calcium, and magnesium. These are all positively charged ions. That force should be down here. And so potassium, calcium, and magnesium are positively charged. So if you have a lot of ammoniacal nitrogen in your system, it can compete with these if the this, this system is out of whack, you know. Um, so you have to be careful of that. Ammonium uptake is optimum at neutral pH, and uptake decreases at lower soil pH, okay. Um, we're gonna talk about nitrogen a little bit more. And then symptoms of ammonium toxicity include ne leaf necrosis of older leaves and stem lesions and stunting of the roots and shoots. And the reason for that is that ammonium can't be stored in the plant. It has to be assimilated into amino acids right away. Carbohydrates aren't there, and I'll talk about this again. If carbohydrates aren't there, ammonium is going to be, you're going to have ammonium toxicity because it needs to be utilized. Nitrate doesn't do that. Um, nitrate competes with phosphorus and sulfur. Why? Because they're both negatively charged. Nitrate is, has one negative charge. Phosphates and sulfates are usually two charges. And so it can compete with that. Nitrate uptake is optimum between 4.5 and 6. Okay. So, so I kind of break things down for each of the nutrients like that. Um, so that should help you. And there's more information there than you'll ever need, I think. I think it will cover most bases. So let's, let's talk about each of the nutrients and why, when we talk about symptoms, why these symptoms occur the way they do. Because there's physiological reasons for everything. So nitrogen is required. 1-6% fertilizer types are ammonium nitrate. We used to get ammonium nitrate, which was great because it kept things neutral. It has a low EC value, and so ammonium nitrate was really nice, but it also explodes, so we can't have that anymore. So we also have urea, which can be wonderful in the wintertime, but there's also precautions with that, and then manures. So welcome aboard, you came in at the right time. <laughs> so anyway, and then cultural ammonium, again, can reduce potassium, calcium, and magnesium uptake, and nitrate can reduce phosphates and sulfate uptake. Um, and I have seen cases where this, this has occurred. So primarily uh, in certain crops, but it has occurred in some cases. So nitrogen is probably, once we figure out nitrogen, I talk about nitrogen today and get it out of the way. The other ones are a little easier, but nitrogen is a little more complex because there's different forms of nitrogen that can be taken up. So let's start off with nitrate. Okay, nitrate's NO3. <coughs> nitrate, when there's not enough carbohydrates in the system, which means, you know, if the plant's not actively growing and for whatever reason the, the photosynthetic capacity is limited, what happens is nitrate can be taken up in the plant, but it, it's going to get stored in the vacuoles because there's not enough carbohydrates to assimilate it into amino acids, okay? So nitrate gets stored and not a problem. 
if there's enough carbohydrates in the system, nitrate gets assimilated into oddly enough ammonia, and then to amino acids and into the protein structures that are needed in the plant. Okay, so nitrate is very adaptable. There's there's things the plant can deal with it when it doesn't have enough carbohydrates in the system. Ammonium, on the other hand, isn't that lucky. Ammonium, if there's enough carbohydrates in the system, it can be assimilated into amino acids and proteins. But if there's not enough carbohydrates in the system, ammonium cannot be stored in the vacuum. The, the plant doesn't have the ability to do that. And so what happens is you have ammonium toxicity. It doesn't know what to do with it. And so you have, you'll get like a, a necrosis on the oldest leaves. It'll start accumulating on this like salt. Leaves will curdle sometimes. Um, so it's, it's just a really bad situation. And so usually that's not a problem if your pH is good because ammonium will be, uh, it'll become nitrified, it'll become nitrate in the soil with nitrifying bacteria. So usually that's not a problem. The only time I've seen this as a problem is in blueberry systems. Uh, where they grow blueberries and they're trying to get the pH down and they put in sulfur and sulfur is a bio, biological process of sulfur reacting in the soil. And so it takes time for sulfur to lower the soil pH. So things will keep putting sulfur on the soil, and before you know it, their pH is three. Yeah. So they end up with ammonium toxicity. So that's why these two are different. And the other thing is, I didn't put in the beginning, but nitrate is an active uptake process because it's negatively charged, going against the chemical gradient. So there's energy required to take nitrate through that electrical chemical gradient. Okay. Ammonium is passive, so it can be taken up easily. Any questions on that? No, but both, both, regardless if you have a nitrogen deficiency, you're always going to see the chlorosis on the oldest leaves and it's going to be uniform. I put this in here, I don't put it in for all of them, all the elements because it's kind of redundant. But you know, your nitrogen cycling in the in this plant system is fertilizers, the substrate, there can be nitrogen coming out of the substrate itself. Uh, there could be nitrogen in the irrigation water, depending on where your wells are located or where you're getting your water. And in the atmosphere, there's nitrogen fixation and pollution. And the sinks, of course, the plants require nitrogen. Microbes in the media require nitrogen. And if you're using sawdust, a lot of, uh, of the products will tie up a lot of the nitrogen. And in the atmosphere, you can get some denitrification. And you can also lose it through ruining volatilization. And that's a big problem in the nursery industry. A lot of the fertilizer can be lost through that process. Um, and of course, our biggest problem when water was running high and we didn't have drought problems, the story was about nitrate runoff in, the, in our environment. And this is what it is. But what's nice about the nursery industry is that mitigating this is not a problem because fertilizer is expensive. People don't want to waste it. So this has been something that the, uh, the industry has been really adamant about not doing anyway because it wastes fertilizer. So people recycle their water. Okay. So what does nitrogen do in the plant? Nitrogen is a building block for many proteins. It's required in the chlorophyll structures and different enzyme processes. And nitrate, because it can be stored in vacuoles, which is the largest compartment in a cell, um, helps with rigidity keeping the plant turgid. So that's probably the most complex element we're going to talk about. The other ones are a little easier, in my head anyway, because nitrogen is just a part of so many different things, being an amino acid. So deficiency symptoms, cold soils, why? Why? Why would cold soils be a problem? It makes it hard for the uptake. But why? What's happening? in the plant system. Roots aren't growing. Roots aren't growing. Just want to make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> There's plenty of coffee there. <laughs> Wet soils, why? Because the oxygen. Low oxygen, oxygen levels. Sandy soils, why? Mm. Nutrients aren't being held in the mm. sandy soils. High carbon nit nitrogen ratio, why? Bacteria. Okay, yeah, the, the microorganisms are tying it, tying it up to break down the carbon source. And then this doesn't happen as much in barks. Why? I 
kind of look glued to this. There's a lot of tannins and stuff in the sparks, and so a lot of things can't break it down. It's, it doesn't taste good. <laughs> I think that's part of it. I don't like tea. I don't like the tannins in tea. Don't have a problem with it in wine, though, so I don't understand. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Okay, and then flooded warm soils because it, there can be some volatilization of the nitrogen coming out of that. Okay, now we get to photographs, which I think is more fun. So here's nitrogen deficiency in corn, and you can go, you can see that the deficiency would be a streaking in the oldest leaves, and the younger, in that, in the newer leaves, it's not so much. This is better sample here in citrus. This is one that has a nitrogen fertilizer, and this one does not. And you can see the oldest leaves have already fallen away, but the next oldest leaves are turning yellow. And it's a uniform yellowing with nitrogen. Okay. When we look at the other nutrients, you're going to see there's differences. Um, and then here's a mum, a potted mum, a uh, chrysanthemum. I don't know what the new genus is now. They keep putting new names on these things. But you can see this whole plant is stunted in addition to the being chloride. So that's nitrogen deficiency of the plant. We're actually doing really well today. I'm talking too fast because I had too much coffee this morning. So I'll slow down. Okay, yellowing, stunting, and, and that's usually what, and I always talk about deficiency symptoms because I really don't know if it's a deficiency until you do a tissue analysis. So mm -hmm. technically you say symptoms. Okay, let's talk about phosphorus. Okay, phosphorus is required uh, usually in the plant about 0 0.2 to 0.5%. It's taken up as phosphates. Um, there's also phosphites, which is also considered a fungicide and helps with phytophthora, and plants can take that up. Um, and that helps with, with the phytophthora, surprisingly, and also uh, helps with some of the phosphorus in the plant. Australian plants are just weird, you know? They have a funny accent, so. <laughs> but they actually can store phosphorus inside the vascular bundles too. It's really strange because they, the soils there are so old and so phosphorus poor, they have different mechanisms of taking it up and storing it. But phosphorus is mobile in the plant, but in the soil it's usually immobile. And culturally, cold soils and an MP ratio of 10 to 1, and also phosphorus can can reduce zinc uptake. So the reason phosphorus runs into problems, we'll see symptoms of this. Um, I'll show you another photo. But the fertilizer sources, uh, the fertilizer substrates, and some irrigation waters will have phosphorus in them. And then the plants take it up, microbes also need it, and chemical precipitation. But it can all, the phosphates can also leak, leach out of our systems. Uh, and then phosphorus was required in DNA and RNA and the genetic material, and then ATP, which is energy. So we need to have that. But it's a mobile element, so deficiency symptoms are going to start in the oldest leaves first. And so you'll see proteoid roots. We talked about that earlier. If there's a phosphorus deficiency in the shoots, then uh, it will form proteoid roots to help mine the soil to get take up that nutrient. But as I said earlier, nitrogen and phosphorus deficiency in the shoots can also elicit the plant to produce these proteoid roots. Okay, so what does phosphorus deficiency look like? Most of the time, phosphorus deficiency will show up as a reddening of the leaves. You'll sometimes see that in the stems. And it usually happens in many other climates in early spring when the soils are cold because the root systems aren't growing yet. It's not that the phosphorus isn't in the media or in the soil, it's just that the roots have not developed yet. And so you might see a phosphorus deficiency. But you'll see a stunting of the roots and you'll see reduced flowering. And then sometimes if you have toxicity, it causes iron, zinc, and copper deficiency if you have too much. And you get a decreased nutrient uptake. So, you know, sometimes one nutrient deficiency can cause a whole other area of nutrient deficiencies in the plant, if the root systems aren't being developed properly, you'll start seeing nutrient deficiencies of other things because the nutrients in general are not being taken up by that root system. So you can see the mom is dark green and stunted, and this is a rice paddy, and you can see the necrosis in the field, and then in corn, this isn't actually a very good photo, 
but there's actually some reddening on the leaves. And then once the soils warm up and the roots start growing, those symptoms disappear. Um, and here's a mum, and there's a slight necrosis at the bottom. But this one's a little more challenging, and it's usually because of cold soils. Um, the other thing is, if you're in the field, and if you're growing a row crop like onions, um, this demonstrates basically how immobile phosphorus is in the soil. Because in this side, you have the phosphorus was broadcast throughout the whole field, and here, the Phosphorus was banded with the onion sets when they were put in. And so the, when the onions start growing, the phosphorus was right there for the, it to be taken up. Okay, because phosphorus has low solubility and, and movement in the soil. Now, when you see this, I don't want you to go home and say, okay, get that fertilizer right next to the root system, because that's going to be the best. That's for phosphorus. <laughs> If you start doing that with other fertilizer types, you can get cell toxicity, fertilizer toxicity, because too much fertilizer is going to solubilize at that root system and burn the roots. So this is just for phosphorus. Any questions? Can you apply phosphorus separately? Can yeah, you, you can. Isolate it it? Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, but usually it's the row crops that do this. So I don't. I don't think for the succulents. Yeah, but I grow onions in my garden. Oh, you do? It's, oh, <laughs> personal. <laughs> I don't blame you, you know? I did garlic one year. I did all kinds of garlics. Oh, God. There's such many different kinds. Yeah. And I went up north to the Gilroy, and I thought there'd be all these different varieties. There weren't. I thought they'd have all these different varieties to try, and I did. So I had to find my own. So I got one called German, Transylvania. Pretty cool. I okay. found that rabbits love garlic. They eat the garlic out of everything I plant. Really? Rabbits are gone. Yeah, I don't know why. I love garlic. Yeah, so I just right. love garlic. Sprout sells dry roasted garlic. Mm -hmm. loaves. I put those on my salad. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Okay, so phosphorus. Let's go back. I really love food. <laughs> okay, potassium. Let's talk about potassium. So there's N, P, and K. So now we're talking about that middle number, potassium. I'm sorry, the third number, in P, K. 1.5 to 4 percent. It's usually taken taken up as potassium. The fertilizer types are potassium salts, KCl, K2SO4, etc. It's mobile in the plant. So where are the deficiency symptoms going to show up? Um, first, hmm? over sleeves. Yeah, um, it's usually immobile in the soil. Um, culturally speaking, sandy acid soils that can be reached out. If you live in Florida or northern Florida, where it's all sand and it rains every day in the summertime, a lot of these will get reached out. If you, anyone from like Georgia or Alabama or anything? Anybody from that region? No. Okay. So the southeast is kind of weird because you know. Aside from the food that they eat, um, it, it has the coastal plain. So it's kind of broken into two sections from North Carolina, part of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and then you move over to um, Alabama, and I think not Mississippi. Mississippi's not in this. But there's a coastal plain of the southeast, and it's all sand. And then you go just to the north of that, and it's this red clay. And it gets on everything and stains everything. But the coastal plain, that sand, it just leaches everything out and it just rains so much in the summertime. So a lot of the plant material will be leached. And this is a problem in those regions. Organic soils also um, can tie it up and then peat soils. What do you mean it's immobile in soils if it can be leached out? So in sandy soils, it's leached out because there's no binding sites. There's no, so potassium is a positively charged ion, so it needs negatively charged binding sites in the soil for it to magnet, go like that. But in other soil types where there's clays and silts, there's more charges in those soils and it can bind to them. And so it can be held on, but not so tight that it can't be let, taken away from the plant, taken away from the soil particle and taken up by the plant. So. So sandy soils will just be leached. 
of, of many nutrients, a very nutrient poor. In Florida and in the coastal plains, uh, the percent organic matter in there is probably less than 0.5%. It's really low. When you get down to South Florida, it's a different game. Um, you get towards the Everglades, it's a muck soil. It's the, the, and so it's a little bit different, you know. And so they have other things to deal with. Okay, potassium functions in the plants. Potassium is important for sugar translocation, which is the carbohydrates, and starch formation, and guard cells. Does everyone know about guard cells and stomachs? So this is part of the top we never go over. Okay, guard cells, so when you have a stomate, stomates are tiny pore openings in the leaves, right? Okay, and some plants are on top of the leaves, some plants are underneath the leaves, some plants are on both sides. And the density of those stomates is also different on different plant types. And so the stomates have to be open, they're very small, but if you were to grow green beans, I know, and take a leaf of a green bean, and put some clear nail polish on it and peel it away, you'll be able to see a little the marks of where the stomates are. So those stomates have to be open, and those are the pores in the leaves for carbon dioxide to go into the leaf for photosynthesis, right? So when the stomates are open, CO2 goes in, and you have CO2, you have photosynthesis occurring, carbon assimilation. Well, there's a, there's a trade-off there. When the stomates are open, um, that means moisture is leaving the leaf, right? You're losing water. And so transpiration goes up with stomates being open. And the more the stomates are open, the higher transpiration rates are. Um, but that's the trade-off for getting CO2 in there. The only exception for the cactus succulent people are some of the lithops and some of those other cam plants. What they do is they open their stomates during the night and take in the CO2, and then they close them up, and then they do photosynthesis during the day when the light's out, and so they're more efficient at losing, not losing as much water with their process. But most plants will open the stomates during the day, CO2 goes in, water comes out, that's transpiration. And the way those, start, those stomates are regulated, there's two guard cells. You know, what do we do? We don't have a marker. Do we have markers? See, see, we cut some of these things up. Gee, Jerry, you just earned your lunch today. I think it does to stay there. It doesn't? Okay, that's okay. So the way this works, the way this works is we have these. I'm smart enough to hold the, the, the whiteboard. For you. you are? <laughs> <laughs> tall enough for He's tall enough, right? <laughs> So there's these little stomates all over the plant. These are little pores, and I'll blow one up. Okay, and so what a stomate looks like is like this. And then there's these two cells. How many guys with a PhD do you need? Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so here's the stomate, and these are called guard cells because they're basically keep it much over everything. Two guard cells per stomate. And so what happens is potassium can go into those cells. And when potassium is in those cells, and these it's kind of weird going to be backwards here, but when those cells are full of potassium, the stomates are open. Okay? And so they're they're turgid. And so the stomates are open. There's enough water in the system. So the stomates are wide open, CO2 goes into the stomates, the transpiration, water evaporation happens out of the stomates. And so, perfect system. But when potassium leaves those cells, then the stomates, when there's wilting basically, the stomates shut down. They close up, they're trying to conserve water. So this pumping system is what works to keep stomates open and closed. Well. If there's a potassium deficiency here, this isn't working very well. And so oftentimes potassium deficiencies, and we'll see in a minute, um, you will see that the symptoms look more like salt stress. And we'll also talk about where on the leaf these deficiency symptoms will show up. And I think we're good on that, Dr. Right. Spinelli. All right. Thank you. My <laughs> pleasure. 
you think being Italian is just provide cannolis for us. <laughs> or not. Um, well, he's Sicilian. Next time, he's specific. What's that? He's Sicilian to be specific. That's true. That's true. <laughs> you know why they call them sardines, right? <laughs> what? I, 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 like, I like food. Sardines. Sardines, originally a little fish, came from Sardinia. So now all the little fish are called sardines, but they all come from Sardinia. <laughs> okay. You didn't smile. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I heard some slang terms this morning. I learned some new ones, but I can't repeat them. Yeah. So we had different ones on the East Coast. There's different slang terms on the East Coast and the West Coast. I don't know. You know, we took turns beating each other up, you know. Um, okay, so potassium is very important in, in turgor regulation of the cells. So we're going to talk about that and show you what the symptoms look like of potassium deficiency in a second. But you can see, um, just like nitrogen, wet compacted soils, sandy leach soils, dry environments can cause potassium deficiency, heavily crop soils, excess application of nitrogen can encourage that. And then high organic soils can also do that. Plants that tend to be susceptible, we've noticed, is our palm, some palm species, and some leafy tropicals. We have leafy tropicals. Who's the leafy tropical person here? Who's growing tropicals? Okay. So we're going to talk about that in a second. So look at this. I, I think this is fascinating. So you have potassium deficiency, yellow speckling on the edges of older leaves. So it's kind of neat. So, and here, this is an avocado. So you see this necrosis on the outer parts of the leaves. So, why do you think potassium deficiency comes up that way? See, this is why you don't have to memorize things. Once you understand what these elements do in the plant, you'll know what the symptoms will occur in the world. Why, why did it happen here? Why isn't there potassium deficiency in here? In the middle of the leaf. Because of where the stomachs are located at. What's that? Where the stomates and the guard cells are located. No, there's stomates. There are stomates throughout the leaves. Mm -hmm. So that's, but that's a good guess. Okay. It just takes time to get it up to the edges of the leaves. Okay, that's that's one way. But the other thing is, where is a lot of transpiration occurring in many leaves? Going to be towards the outer edges, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to see that lack of regulation of functioning of, of water loss occurring primarily out in the outer parts of the leaves, right? So that's why you'll see potassium deficiency also starting to develop out there and why those symptoms occur there. Same here, you see it starts to develop out here. There's more transpiration going on in the outer parts of the leaves than towards the center. The other thing you can look at, you know, I, I told you earlier that you'll see symptoms that will occur um, it's uniform in the plant. But if you're growing trees in some, like that larger plant material, you know, it can also, the symptoms earlier, the symptoms can start evolving on the plant. Where do you think on the plant symptoms might start evolving first? If you're a tree. And orientation in the, in, in, on the, uh, on the tree. Where would, a lot, where, would, where would you think water loss would occur mostly in a tree? And I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying to give you not too many hints. So, the new the growth. Outside leaves. What's that? The outside leaves. The outside yeah. leaves? New growth. New growth. True, new growth can be, that's, that's another problem. Yeah, so that would, that throws this out the window, right? <laughs> um, but if you look at the southwest side of the tree, right, it's hotter usually mm -hmm. and so you, you might start seeing some of the symptoms starting a little earlier on that side of the tree than you would on the on the shadier side of the tree so there's things like that you have to pay attention to also um, when you're starting to look for symptoms eventually it will be uniform but you can if you look cl closely at some things the orientation of the tree you can actually uh, maybe see these symptoms developing earlier and, and take care of the problem so, and here's potassium deficiency here. Again, necrosis. A little bit of orange, a little bit of necrosis. Um, so yellow and speckling of the older leaves, leaf scorched with burnt lodging of grasses and then toxicity. So a lot of times people, 
pat in the past. I don't know. I haven't heard this thrown out in the market lately. That potassium is an anti-stress element because it helps with transpiration and mitigating, reducing water loss. Because when you have enough potassium, you can your stomates are regulated. So what people were doing is they were applying too much potassium, <laughs> and they were inducing magnesium deficiency, which is another symptom. Okay, so sulfur. Sulfur is required. 0.1 to 0.5 percent is taken up as sulfates. Fertilizer types: magnesium sulfate, potassium sulfate. Sulfur is not normal in the plant, so usually you see deficiency symptoms on, towards a newer growth. Um, it is mobile in the soil culturally. Again, this is like a broken record or whatever the term is now. What's the broken cloud? I don't know. What they sort of doing. Sandy acid soils, organic soils, and peat soils and cold soils. Again, because of rich on growing. Um, and then the function of the plant, again, is protein synthesis, stress-induced proteins, and pathogen-induced proteins, and also sulfur has certain enzymes, is involved in enzymes for nitrogen assimilation. So sometimes deficiency symptoms aren't as differentiated in new growth or old growth like they would with some of the other nutrients. Um, so let's see. So here's sulfur deficiency, and this is what I'm talking about. You see, even though it's not mobile, it still has, you, you see more uniform yellowing or off color with sulfur deficiency and then tomato, the same thing. Um, if you were to look at root systems, you'd be seeing longer unbranched roots. So what happens is you get these longer roots, but they're not branching. So you don't get the ability of the plant's rhizosphere to develop fully. And so you might start seeing some other deficiency symptoms. I press something back to it. Okay, toxicity. So, and then deficiencies. Usually, we don't have deficiency symptoms um, because we still have enough sulfur in most of our systems, but in rural areas, we'll start seeing that. So, do we want to take a break? Okay, let's take a break. So, let's stop here and then we're going to pick up with the other nutrients and then.